This is two video clips that I edited and spliced together. The first video clip was downloaded from YouTube user ThoughtCrime7. He compares the differences in taking regular vitamin C versus injections of vitamin C versus liposomal vitamin C. While the FDA and Health Canada recommend 60 milligrams of vitamin C per day, vitamin C guru Dr. Linus Pauling recommends 18 times as much for optimal health. Dr. Pauling is the only person to have earned two unshared Nobel Prizes. Following his own advice, Dr. Pauling lived to be 92. One orange contains about 60 milligrams of vitamin C. Rather than eating 17 oranges a day, Dr. Pauling just took regular vitamin C supplements. Oral vitamin C supplements deliver only 20% of the vitamin C into the bloodstream. So ingesting a 1,000 milligram tablet or capsule will deliver about 200 milligrams of vitamin C into your bloodstream. A direct injection of 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C will result in the absorption of about 700 milligrams of vitamin C into your bloodstream. Liposomal encapsulated vitamin C is absorbed at a rate of at least 80%. In other words, 1,000 milligrams of liposomal encapsulated vitamin C will result in the absorption of at least 800 milligrams of vitamin C into your bloodstream, even better than direct injection. The doctor conference clip was downloaded from YouTube user Mr. Benton Mike. And after watching this video, it really makes me question the intentions of the big pharmaceutical companies, especially knowing that a short while back, they were actually pushing for a ban on certain vitamins. Vitamin C was at the top of their hit list. Had they pushed through their agenda, you could have only purchased low dosages of vitamin C over the counter, and the only way you could purchase higher doses was with a doctor's prescription. Sorry, but someone was in someone else's pocket. I'd like to introduce Tom, Dr. Thomas Levy, former assistant professor of medicine at Tulane Medical School and fellow of the American College of Cardiology. He's the author of four books, including Curing the Incurable, Vitamin C, Infectious Disease, and Toxins. Please welcome Dr. Levy. You want to go this way, forward, this way. Good morning. It's definitely my pleasure to speak to this group. Uh, I think I have some exciting and practical information that just about everybody that practices medicine can actively incorporate into their practice for the benefit of their patients. <clears throat> Probably back in the 1930s, Dr. Albert St. Georgie a Nobel Prize laureate, discovered vitamin C. Uh, there were a lot of other researchers working on vitamin C at the time, but for better or for worse, Dr. St. Georgie got the credit. One thing at the time, and since then, over the subsequent few years that St. Georgie did a lot of work with vitamin C, he came up with a very interesting hypothesis that I believe the evidence now indicates is firmly rooted in fact and clinical efficacy. And that is, if you will, the electron flow theory of disease and health. And very simply, because it is in fact simple, health is a state of high electron flow, disease is a state of low electron flow, or exchange, if you will. And of course, with antioxidants and pro-oxidants, the Romulus and Remus of the body, antioxidants supply electrons, pro-oxidants, free radicals, uh, receive and take away electrons. And as we'll see in a moment, toxins and infections are virtually all pro-oxidant. Vitamin C, as what I will call the premier antioxidant for the body, readily donates electrons. Now, I'll address one other thing at this point in time because it invariably seems to cause 
a lot of confusion because it's not properly addressed in the literature <clears throat> is when they say other antioxidants such as vitamin C <clears throat> uh, are sometimes pro-oxidants. Well, let me first say vitamin C is never anything but an antioxidant because it never does anything but donate electrons. If the only thing you do is donate electrons, you can only be an antioxidant. Now, what you'll see often in the literature is in a subset of microenvironments where there is a relatively large amount of uh, ferric or cupric ion, the donation of electrons in that subsystem through a chemical reaction called the Fenton reaction will result in net pro-oxidant activity by the production of a number of free radicals. The vitamin C and the other antioxidants still did nothing but donate electrons, but in that subset, there's a pro-oxidant activity. And also in contrast to what is held by a lot of people, a large amount of antioxidant will always have nothing but an antioxidant activity. So the moment you get above what clinically is a fairly low dose of vitamin C, 200, 300, 400 milligrams, you'll always have net antioxidant activity. Now, I like to point out a lot of the different important antioxidants in the body and in the diet that we use. And by no means do I ever want to leave any group of medical practitioners with the idea that vitamin C is the only important antioxidant. All antioxidants basically are the same <clears throat> insofar as to the donation of electrons. But we obviously know there are tremendous different clinical effects of one nutrient to another, one antioxidant to another, and I would submit to you that that has to do with the bioavailability of the substance itself. Alpha lipoic acid, for example, is fat soluble and water soluble. Vitamin C is predominantly water-soluble. Vitamin E is predominantly fat-soluble. Other stereochemical attributes of the nutrients will see that some get high levels in one tissue or organ, some get high levels in another, and that will affect and determine the clinical nature of the effects that that particular antioxidant has. Uh, vitamin C eventually gets into just about every tissue in the body, which is probably why it's the most profoundly effective antioxidant on different clinical conditions, especially if you take a high enough dose. And acetylcysteine is another particularly important one because uh, there have been a number of studies that have shown that NAC, for example, uh, can directly bind mercury as one of the heavy metal toxins uh, and promote its elimination. <clears throat> Silymarin and silybenin, other prominent antioxidants that, due to their chemical nature, appear to concentrate in the liver, so they seem to have predominantly good effects in liver conditions. Coenzyme Q10 uh, collects in active muscle cells in the heart. Glutathione, uric acid. Uric acid is a very, very interesting one. Uh, we all consider that you know, a, basically a toxin. It accumulates until it causes gout. Well, there's a very good paper to show that uric acid is a pronounced antioxidant. And in the states in which uric acid is elevated, and I saw this a great deal with a large number of patients when I worked some 10 years ago with Dr. Hal Huggins on dentally toxic patients, they'd come in with high uric acid levels, and two weeks later, when their root canals, mercury, abscesses, other infections were gone, their uric acid was down to normal. I would suggest that the uric acid elevated because it was one of the few ways in which the body could provide some antioxidant protection against the toxicity of the dental, dental process. A very interesting thing, too, uh, I saw Dr. Barnley here earlier. I don't know if he's going to be lecturing later or not, but magnetic fields. I've worked with biomagnets for a very long time now, 
And it always struck me that clinically, a good, strong North Pole magnet appeared to have the same effects as vitamin C on a wide variety of different, different conditions, inflammation, burns, tumors, etc. And then I realized that magnetism is explained as electron flow. And in fact, when you have a North Pole, bio, a North Pole biomagnet against the skin, you're bringing electrons in. When you flip it over and you have the South Pole against the skin, you're bringing electrons out. So it's, a, if you will, what I look upon as a mechanical form of vitamin C and antioxidant. Now, probably the two things that are best documented in the literature, and I'd pretty much like to limit myself today not to everything that I think and pretty much no vitamin C can do, but things that you can look at the literature and see for yourself that it's done. And you'll see in your, uh, in your handouts that I have a pretty extensive list of scientific references for just about every significant point I make here. And I would encourage you, where you have any reluctance at all to uh, think that uh, what I'm saying has validity, to check some of these references for yourself. <clears throat> infections and toxins. First, infections. Infections are always strong promoters of oxidation. And in every paper that I went through, and it was quite a few, that looked at infections and also measured parameters of oxidation, there was always increased laboratory evidence of oxidative stress. Oxidative stress, i.e. pro-oxidant, i.e. free radical, i.e. the antithesis of an antioxidant. And again, where they measured it, where they looked at tissues, body fluids, blood, there were also always decreased levels of antioxidants. So the very presence of an infection appeared to directly mean that whatever levels of antioxidants were present were being consumed or metabolized. And there's also a number of reports that have shown that when the infection is severe, you have a massive consumption of antioxidants and you can often get a clinical syndrome of scurvy. And it's very rarely recognized as scurvy because the few times that scurvy are seen these days are usually chronic states. So you're seeing somebody who's debilitated, fighting infections, uh, periodontal disease, etc. But when you induce scurvy dramatically and quickly, the thing that you primary see, primarily see is hemorrhage. This is what happens in an Ebola virus. You have some poor native in Africa that has three molecules of vitamin C in their body, and they get Ebola virus. All their antioxidants are consumed very rapidly, and their method of demise there is, is bleeding, is hemorrhage. <clears throat> now, when you're dealing with infections, you're just about always dealing with a clinical picture of toxicity as well, regardless of the infection. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, not all, but many infections, the microorganism itself is either toxic, an endotoxin, or the microorganism itself secretes as a metabolic byproduct a toxin, an exotoxin. We all know the many different infectious diseases that do this. Diphtheria, pertussis, the list goes on. Now, another point that I think is much, much less realized, but always present, always present, when a severe infection is entrenched in the body, is the infection itself consumes your antioxidant protection. And as your antioxidant protection is consumed, you lose its ability to neutralize whatever toxins are already present in your body. So a rapidly fulminant infection without a lot of antioxidant administration 
can give you additionally the classic picture of mercury, lead, just about any heavy metal or any significant toxicity you can imagine because they're no longer able to be neutralized because the antioxidants are being consumed by the infection. So this is all part of the complex clinical picture that we see over and over again with severe infections. <clears throat> Toxins by themselves. Every article I came across again that addressed this question clearly showed that all toxins are pro-oxidant, i.e. all toxins consume and take electrons in. Also, all toxins are completely or partially quenched by the presence of electrons and the donation of electrons. Thus, the effect we'll see of vitamin C. Because of this pro-oxidant effect, again, where you measure it, toxins will reliably consume or oxidize vitamin C and other antioxidants that are already present in the body. And it's been very well established that when you have a high enough and acute enough toxin load, you will acutely produce scurvy. So repeating fulminant infections and potent toxins often acutely cause scurvy, but their symptoms are not recognized as such. And in fact, it's been established way back in the 50s that acute scurvy is often the cause of death in infections and toxin exposures. Now, sometimes when the infection is not rapidly and widely systemic and overwhelming, the scurvy or vitamin C deficiency that's induced will be focal, not body-wide. Uh, probably one of the better examples of this is in periodontal disease. When you, in, in advanced periodontal disease, they've actually done biopsies of, of gum and found vitamin C levels to be just about at zero. No detectable vitamin C in the gum tissue in the presence of advanced periodontal disease, which makes a lot of sense in light of all the information we've just looked at. So what is a practical suggestion here? Well, wherever you have a clearly established infection, a clearly established condition of increased toxicity or intoxication, regardless of whatever else you're doing to treat the patient, you should always vigorously supplement vitamin C because the toxin in the infection itself is automatically inducing a vitamin C deficiency. And if, this, if that's not bad enough, when you look at the research on vitamin C, a vitamin C deficiency is always going to acutely compromise your immune system and make any other things that you do that much more difficult to be truly efficacious in the presence of an ongoing vitamin C deficiency. <coughs> Now, oops. as far as evidence and what's already been accomplished and published in the literature, and again, this is uh, pretty well summarized in the references <coughs> that you can go to if you so choose. Vitamin C, by virtue of the work of Dr. Frederick Klenner, is an absolute viricide. Again, in all the literature that I've reviewed, and it's been quite massive, so far there's not been a single virus which when brought into direct contact with adequate levels of vitamin C, either in vitro or in vivo, where the, vitamin, where the virus is not 100% inactivated or destroyed, period. Really, the only times you have any sort of clinical failure in treating a viral syndrome with vitamin C is usually going to be one of two situations. Most commonly, <coughs> not enough vitamin C is being administered, but also 
There are some viral syndromes, usually the chronic ones, chronic hepatitis C, not acute, uh, chronic Lyme, not acute, AIDS, again, not acute. In these situations, the virus appears to be, if you will, hidden. It's not openly available uh, for access to the vitamin C. Uh, in AIDS, for example, you'll have the RNA of a virus incorporated into some of the immune cells. That can be a very difficult access problem. <coughs> My personal hypothesis is if you treated long enough and high enough with vitamin C and other antioxidants, you would likely cure these syndromes a great percentage of the time, but it would have to be over a long enough period of time that all the immune cells turn over, that they go through their life phase, they release their nucleic acid, the antioxidants are present to neutralize the viral nucleic acid before it gets reincorporated into a new immune cell. <coughs> now, in addition to being an absolute viricide, Vitamin C is also strongly microbiocidal in general. It will facilitate the cure of most infectious diseases. Also, very important, nobody has to feel like they have to stop using what they're already using or stop using what maybe they consider to be a reasonably effective uh, uh, cure for something, and by no means if a patient comes in with pneumococcal pneumonia, don't give them penicillin. That's not the message at all. Vitamin C is intimately involved in the immune system and facilitates the development of antibodies, facilitates the manufacture and secretion of interferon, <clears throat> and does a wide number of supportive functions to both the B cells and the T cells. So, use them both. About the only time vitamin C will cause any problems with your traditional therapy, whatever that might be, is if that therapy is pro-oxidant. If that therapy is pro-oxidant, like certain chemotherapeutic agents are, and you give them simultaneously, yeah, the vitamin C is going to neutralize that like it'll neutralize any other toxin. But it still doesn't mean you have to give that up. All you have to do is change the timing of the dosage. You give whatever therapy it is that's pro-oxidant and wait enough period of time, usually several hours for it to get absorbed and into the tissues, have its effect, then you give your vitamin C to come in and mop up the oxidative damage that's done while preserving the positive clinical effect that the other drug had. Now, again, these are all documented. Klenner back in 1948. Klenner was one about the first person that started using vitamin C actively as a therapeutic agent, a chemotherapeutic agent. I don't really know, even after reading all the papers on him, how he completely came up with the incredible insight that he had to do what he did. But in the middle of a polio epidemic in Reedsville, North Carolina in 1948, where, if you're old enough to remember this personally, uh, kids were dropping like flies, and kids were being paralyzed for life. Klenner treated 60 consecutive infants with intravenous and intramuscular vitamin C, mostly intramuscular because they were so small, and he had 60 complete cures. About half of the kids were documented with spinal tap, and the other half, well, it was the middle of, a, of an epidemic. It really wasn't difficult to see that here's another case of polio coming rolling into the emergency room. Now, interestingly enough, about 57 of these 60 were cured in three days. The other three took another couple days. Also, interestingly, another, I believe, young girl six or seven years old, I don't remember the age exactly, who already had polio for several weeks and already had flaccid paralysis of her legs for four days. Complete and total dead meat. In this young patient, again, it took a little longer, two weeks, but she had a complete cure and brought back all of her neurologic function. 
And it's just an incredible and awful and horrible shame that diseases like this are still not treated with vitamin C. There's nothing else that even comes close. Nothing. Hepatitis. I emphasize acute hepatitis versus I talked about the chronic hepatitis before. Hepatitis is one of the most dramatic things you can treat with vitamin C. You give 50, 75, 100 grams a day of vitamin C intravenously to an acute hepatitis patient in a large liver, fever, jaundice, the type of patient that's going to be sick for anywhere from two to six months. And they're clinically well most of the time in three to four days and laboratory-wise cured in seven to ten days. Every time. Measles and mumps, these are very easy for hepatitis, uh, for uh, vitamin C, but more importantly, I'm sure all of you are aware that often enough, measles and mumps have a lot of secondary problems, neurologic problems, uh, CNS problems. Vitamin C has worked very well uh, in these cases as well. Encephalitis was perhaps some of the most dramatic things that Dr. Klinner worked with. I don't know how many patients he might have treated that were in a coma that didn't get well. I only know the ones that he reported on in his articles. And on the ones that he reported on in his articles, every one of his patients that had encephalitis, often comatose, comatose, were completely cured in three to four days. They would usually regain consciousness anywhere from three to ten hours after the vitamin C was initiated. Again, it's pretty heady stuff. It's and in, in probably until you jump in there and start using it yourself, you, you just can't really believe that treating some of our most horrendous illnesses still are so easily cured and certainly so easily controlled. Mononucleosis. I've had the opportunity myself. I, as a cardiologist, I don't see a lot of acute infectious patients. But every now and then, somebody with chest pain has something else going on. And then on at least uh, two separate patients that had mononucleosis, they were both uh, young college girls, They'd, both of them, they're almost like twin clinical histories, had had to drop out of college for the uh, last four to six months because they were just so horribly fatigued, headaches, everything else. Both of these young ladies were fine in three to four days, complete cures. Uh, in, the in entitling my book, Curing the Incurable, I don't aim to be inflammatory, I just aim to be accurate. Okay, we're very, very reluctant in medicine to use the word cure because they, we have so many naysayers that want to come along and say, oh, you're providing false hope. Well, where a cure has been clearly provided for a specific disease, repeatedly with a specific therapy and you don't use the word cure, you're doing even greater harm. Viral pneumonia, diphtheria, all of these have ex it responded incredibly well to vitamin C. Now, vitamin C is also, by all the literature I've reviewed and it's been extensive, the absolute ideal non-specific antitoxin. You find me a toxin, I've got the cure. The only time it's not going to work is if the toxin has been present in such a high dose, in such a dramatic organ penetration, and too much irreversible tissue damage is the game over. But if it's just at the early stages, and oftentimes at the advanced stages, but at the early stages, again, I haven't found one that vitamin C won't neutralize. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, with uh, tetanus, Klenner described one patient, classical lockjaw. The, the child just kept on getting huge, horrible muscle spasms, was very close to losing the airway. And this was interesting because it was a patient that Klenner had to co-manage with another physician. So it's easy to know what Klenner did. He started giving a lot of vitamin C. 
and the kids started getting better dramatically quickly. Well, the other physicians started giving a lot of antitoxin, and every time another dose of antitoxin came along, the kid got worse. And finally, Klenner just had to give enough vitamin C to not only neutralize the tetanus, but neutralize the toxic antitoxin that was being given. The other thing, too, that we all face on a daily basis, especially when we're quote-unquote not in the mainstream, I, I, I hate those phraseologies, but they're there and they're real, is having to defend yourself for what you do, or maybe even more specifically, what you don't do. Uh, again, that was one of the primary reasons why I put a huge number of references uh, out there so that there is reinforcement for what's, for what's being done. However, as I said earlier, if you're never comfortable with using vitamin C as a monotherapy, use all the other standard therapies. That's okay. And if you use a high, dose enough, high enough dose of vitamin C, you'll cure the condition and you'll neutralize the toxicity of the mainstream therapy, the antitoxin, the snake bite toxin, uh, antitoxin, you name it. Probably some of the other more incredible case histories that Klenner reported were with carbon monoxide. He'd bring patients out in minutes with IV vitamin C. Also on some of the insect bites and other toxic bite syndromes that he faced, I think it's very important to understand the rapidity with which not only toxins can have their toxic effect, but vitamin C and other antioxidants can have their antitoxic effect. If you look through his articles, you'll see some dramatic occasions where I think in one case it was a brown recluse spider. This patient came in having been recently bit comes into Klenner's office and I might, I might add Klenner had a policy in his office to start the vitamin C and then take the history. <laughs> so this patient lays down on his table and he says, you know, doc, I think I'm going out. He took the blood pressure, it was like 80 or 75 over zero. Well, Klenner did something that most people would think unfathomable. And believe it or not, a lot of doctors today, especially quote unquote mainstream, would consider what Klenner did to be uniformly fatal to anybody that it was done to. But I can tell you that's simply not true because I've done it many times myself and to myself. And what Klenner did was he started a butterfly in the patient's arm, and then he took uh, the highest concentration a vitamin C, the way it comes today in the, in the uh, ampules or vials, I think it's 500 milligrams per cc. And he gave something on the order of uh, 7 to 10 grams. IV push, and in Klenner's own words, as rapidly as a 20 gauge needle will allow. That's the rate. So don't ask me how many drops per minute or drops per second. You just push on the syringe until sweat pops out on your forehead, and that's the rate that Claire used. <laughs> and before the syringe was all the way down, the patient was coming out of it. And when you're getting high enough doses of vitamin C in the patient, this is how quickly they respond from snake bite and other circumstances. When I see news shows, I saw one Last night or the night before, this poor little girl who's just come out of a long-standing coma from her West Nile virus. I've cured two cases of West Nile virus, the only two cases that have come to me. Very simple. West Nile has been one of the most responsive viral syndromes I've ever seen. Nobody, nobody should die or be sick of West Nile virus. Please remember that. Nobody. Mushroom poisoning, how toxic is that? If you don't die, you have a 50% chance of liver failure. Interestingly enough, 
This was first cured by a Frenchman uh, several decades ago by the name of Lang, I think L-A-I-N-G. And he used a combined protocol of, I believe, alpha lipoic acid, milk thistle, and a paltry three or four grams of vitamin C. Anyway, he was so effective in totally reversing uh, Amanita phylloides mushroom toxicity, one of the most severe toxins I know of, that whenever he put on a lecture or talked around the world or around the country, he would uh, start by taking three to four times the lethal dose of mushrooms right on the spot. That's what you call confidence in your, uh, <laughs> in, in your theories and beliefs. Since there's always another, another circumstances that you've never allowed for, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite into taking uniformly fatal doses of anything to prove my point. <laughs> Lead and other heavy metal poisonings. The first exposure that I had to the incredible abilities and capabilities of intravenous vitamin C was with Dr. Hal Huggins. For those of you who don't know Dr. Huggins, he's I consider to be the world's most prominent authority on mercury toxicity from dental fillings and has now a lot of people are on the bandwagon but Hal was pretty much fighting the fight all alone 25, 30, 35 years ago. Well I was in Colorado Springs and Hal and I were talking at a conference together and he said come on by my clinic sometime and so I did and I saw things that weren't supposed to happen. I saw patients that had been wheelchair bound for a couple years get up and take a few steps after two weeks when all the dental toxicity was properly removed from their mouth. But significantly with regard to vitamin C, Hal would always give everybody that got their dental work an IV of vitamin C, 35 to 50 grams infused before, during and after the dental work. I saw patients horribly ill, I mean they, they didn't even feel like they, they wanted to be alive, that would come in and get three or four root canals extracted and half a dozen amalgam fillings replaced. And the same night they felt so good they wanted to go out and chew on a steak on their remaining teeth. I said something's not, something's not right here, something's not meshing with my understanding of medicine and disease and illness and toxicity. And that started me initially on my work on vitamin C and in addition obviously to the loss of toxicity when things are properly done with the toxicity in the mouth you can get tremendous clinical responses very quickly, non-specifically with intravenous vitamin C. Pesticides, this would work dramatically too. <clears throat> Uh, radiation toxicity. Remember this is just a prototypical evidence of pro-oxidant activity and there's a huge amount of literature to show that when you have a high enough dose of vitamin C and other antioxidants this is an easily neutralized syndrome too. Now if a nuclear bomb drops 50 miles away I don't know it might be too much too much radiation there but by the same token I don't know what the guideline will be if you're sitting there with your 100 gram vitamin C infusion going, you might make it. Uh, quickly, not to minimize the importance, but due to time considerations, it's very important when you're dealing with toxicity, when you're trying to overall improve your patient's long-term health, not to just neutralize their toxicity for the moment, but to get to the sources of their toxicity. I've been involved in two different books related on this topic uh, and the science is overwhelming. It's not subtle, it's overwhelming. Root canal treated teeth, in my opinion, the scientific literature shows, are the most toxic entities on the planet 100%. And if it's not 100%, then it's 99 plus because over 5,000 extracted root canal teeth that we've sent to Dr. Haley for examination 100% have been highly toxic.
not 99.9100. When you do a root canal, you carve out the nerve and blood supply. Guess what? You took away the immune system's access to the tooth. Uh, a lymphocyte can't jump across the Grand Canyon. It's got to have blood supply, nerves, in order to get to the bacteria in the tooth. So once you've had a root canal done, that tooth is never sterile again, and it's producing enormous toxins, often more toxic than botulism. Toxicity consumes antioxidants, and it's just about impossible to keep your level of antioxidant protection high enough when you have these entities present. In 1950, Dr. Joseph Issels in Germany, at a time probably when less than 1% of the population had root canals, he ran a quote-unquote, I hate the word, alternative cancer clinic. And over 95% of his cancer patients had root canals. Hmm, maybe that's a coincidence. Periodontal disease, also highly toxic. When it's advanced, I consider it to be the equivalent of uh, 32 root canals. Never underestimate the toxicity of periodontal disease. And again, I'll give you a piece of evidence that'll just help your patients incredibly. And it also puts the periodontist out of business, periodontologist. Buy a water pick. Pour a couple capfuls of hydrogen peroxide, 3%. percent that would have to be something elaborate. Put a little of water or mouthwash. Water pick twice a day. The first three or four days, the patient with horrible gum disease will bleed like crazy. A week later, the bleeding will be less. Two weeks later, there'll be no bleeding, and if you take before and after pictures where the gum was flat, you'll now see new ingrowth of gum tissue. And you eliminate that huge source of infection, which has been clearly documented to be a major cause of heart disease. <coughs> Dental implants. Not bad theoretically, but they're always done immediately or too close to extraction, and they screw it through an area of developing cavitation and toxicity. So if they let things completely heal up and then use non-toxic materials, maybe, maybe it would be an acceptable procedure. But the way it's done now, it's as toxic as anything else. Toxic dental materials, uh, aluminum, stainless steel, these are all highly toxic things. Orthopedic medicine stopped using them a long time ago because of increased cancer risk, but dentistry never followed suit. Cavitations. Just about every large tooth that you get extracted ultimately ends up with a, po a pocket of necrotic material with toxins in them, the same level of toxicity as a root canal. Abscess is horribly toxic. If you have an abscess tooth, get it out yesterday. Teeth cleaning. Nothing wrong with getting your teeth clean, but you probably won't have to do it if your calcium phosphorus is in balance, if you water pick with the hydrogen peroxide. But if you do, take your vitamin C before, because you're going to release a huge amount of toxins and bacteria into the bloodstream acutely during that period. <clears throat> Safety of vitamin C. It's still incredible, the attacks on vitamin C. I can only imagine it's because it's so highly beneficial. What's this about vitamin C and kidney stones? Newsflash. In people with normal renal function, you'll see there's some precaution if there's existing kidney disease. But in normal renal function, I think uh, it's a northeastern school, uh, Harvard. Harvard. In a very large study, over 50,000 people, they showed vitamin C not only did not cause kidney stones, it reduced the incidence of kidney stones, and it helped resolve pre-existing kidney stones. Organ transplants. This has always been a theoretical one. It's a vitamin C uh, stimulates your immune system. Well, it's probably going to cause your organs to be rejected then because you're taking immunosuppressives. But in point of fact, so far, vitamin C has been associated with lower rejection in the animal studies that they've done. Now, maybe there's a magic dose, so that'd be different. I don't know. Rebound. This is important in people that are taking large doses of vitamin C on a regular basis. They get into a car accident. They go into the hospital. They get emergency surgery. Five days later, they're in the ICU. 
they haven't taken a molecule of vitamin C for five days, yes, you can get into some acute, post-operative, infectious, scurvy situations, and your family members should be aware enough to make sure that you continue taking some vitamin C during periods like that, because that can be an increased time of danger if you've been taking it for a long time and then you're taking it off, surgical stress, infection, things can go downhill quickly. Let's see, finally, <clears throat> proper administration of vitamin C, and this is gonna be a very abbreviated version, but dose, multigram, no 100, 200, 300, 400 milligrams. Uh, give that to your flowers. <clears throat> Root, intravenous, intravenous for maximal effect, but don't ignore the opportunity, even if your patient is getting 100 or 150 grams of vitamin C intravenously, not to take their total oral dose as well. You get more vitamin C in, you start cleaning up a toxic gut. A lot of the microbes in the gut produce endotoxins in the same way that a root canal tooth does. Rate depends on the clinical status. If the patient's not getting better quick enough, Klenner gave more, more frequently. Frequency, duration, type, whoo, one minute. So I'm gonna leave you dangling. Uh, my next research project is to show exactly how toxic everybody is making themselves and their beloved older women and their family with calcium. Calcium, I'm going to tell you, is toxic in the long run and is going to cause a whole lot more problems with heart attack and cancer than an arguable reduction in osteoporosis fracture rate. So I avoid calcium. Uh, as an ascorbate because I advise high levels of ascorbate and it, it has far too high associated calcium with it. Adjunct therapies, like I said, don't avoid those because vitamin C will just about always operate synergistically with whatever else you're using. Thank you.